Canadians are one week away from heading to the ballot box in the country's 44th federal election. We've just come out of the first weekend of advanced polling, and the leaders and candidates continue to stump for your approval. According to a number of polls, the top issues for Canadians are affordability, housing, and economic recovery from the pandemic. What do you think of the plans to get us on the road to recovery? Hello and welcome to Unpublished TV. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. More than a year and a half after the pandemic arrived on our shores, Canada continues to grapple with the economic impact. Vaccines are available. Lockdowns have eased. But the economy continues to be sluggish. Our unpublished.vote question asked you, which party has the best plan to get the Canadian economy back on track? The results, the Liberals, 3.2%. Conservatives, 24%. NDP, 0.7%. The Green, 1.4%. The People's Party of Canada, 68.7%. Other, 0.7%. And none of the above, 1.4%. However, you're watching and listening to our show, whether through our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, or our podcast channels, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeart, radio and more i'd like to remind you, you can still cast your vote on this topic at unpublished.vote and email your mp to tell them why now joining us to discuss the economic recovery plans in this election ian scott is with the sprott school of business at carlton university carl narenberg is the political reporter for rabble and ryan mala is the senior director of provincial affairs for ontario at the canadian federation of independent business and uh gentlemen thank you for for joining us and obviously, the numbers that jump out there, 68.7% uh, of the people who took our vote feel the PPC has the biggest or best economic plan to get us out of the uh, out of the situation. Ian, we'll start with you. The PPC laid the blame for uh, the lack of housing on, on immigration. Now, can reducing immigration make an impact or is the demand still there? Um, I don't agree with uh, the, the claim by the PPC. Um, there is a fundamental structural imbalance uh, in Canada um, in housing, and this has been shown, demonstrated by Scotiabank, uh, by the senior vice president, chief economist, who, by the way, is a former assistant deputy minister of Finance Canada, uh, it was shown by Canada Mortgage and Housing. And um, I have been blaming uh, very publicly um, uh, urban, the uh, municipal councils across Canada and the larger cities, where they are very publicly, this isn't a secret, they're publicly saying we've got to slow down growth, we can't have urban sprawl. And so they have been restricting the supply of houses. Uh, yes, population is growing because of immigration, but it's also growing through, through uh, natural uh, birth, the natural birth rate. Um, so uh, I, it's not a question of, uh, I think it's wrong to blame it on, on immigration. The issue is, you in any country, you should be building an adequate supply for whatever the population growth is, regardless of why it's growing. And we are not doing that. We're in, in, in the sense that we're not building the housing to uh, address uh, what, what is needed. Not everybody needs a three-bedroom, two-bathroom home, right? Like we're talking about various different forms of housing. I mean, the Scotiabank, to answer your, I, I'm not getting into that debate because I, I think it's a mugs game, you know, whether, a, you know, an 800 square foot ho a home is optimal versus a 2,200, you know, the buyer makes that decision. That's the kind of a country we live in. We It's a, it's a decentralized decision. But uh, my point is, is that uh, and Scotiabank came up with a study that we have 1.8 million uh, houses less when you compare us to other high income countries on a house per capita basis. And you compare us to other high income countries, there is a shortage. And I'm not getting into whether it's a, you know, small apartments or big apartments or small houses or big houses. There's a, an inadequate supply of housing. And it's been driven by the people who are mostly in control of it, which is at the municipal level. They control the bylaws. They control housing rules uh, because it is a local issue. And, and so for that reason, what I'm arguing is, and the data suggests is that we do have a serious imbalance, hmm. a shortfall of supply that has been induced by policy, not by, I don't know, little green men from outer space. <laughs> it was created by public policy, this shortage, and we can solve it through public policy. Uh, Carl, the, in terms of the PPC economic plan, they, they're talking about eliminating the capital gains tax. And, and I wonder if that's the case, where does the government make up that shortfall? <laughs> they don't. They don't make up the shortfall unless they significantly, very significantly cut programs and no party 
uh, with a chance of winning any significant number of seats in Parliament, is now produce, uh, is now proposing that any programs be cut at this point. In fact, they're all proposing that uh, programs be uh, enhanced and increased and it will be spent more. So uh, if you cut a major source of revenue like the capital gains tax, uh, you're going to have to have make make deep cuts in spending. And uh, I'm not so sure for the PPC. I'm sorry I haven't checked the PPC uh, uh, program, mm-hmm. but I'm not so sure they have particular um, proposals as to where to cut. Uh, maybe if, if they want to end immigration, they could cut the Ministry of Immigration. That's not that expensive, though. That wouldn't be... That wouldn't cost. That doesn't cost. That's a bunch of bureaucrats. It doesn't cost that much money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Ryan, uh, obviously, with uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and Small Business having difficulty finding workers as things are opening up now, I, I'm wondering: is this a reflection of wages? Is this a reflection of the CERB being available? What do you think? It, it is to a point. It plays in. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the CERB is the difference between a full time employee holding a job and staying at home. The reality is, it just does not cover that much money. Um, when it comes into part-timers, I think it's it's a little bit there. But I think there are a lot of other things at play too. Immigration certainly being one of them. We would normally be taking in a lot more immigrants into this country that would be filling a lot of the roles that we are seeing go unfilled and would help on the labor shortage side. Um, we also saw young people in particular be either a little more vaccine hesitant or lower on the priority list to get vaccinated. And when it comes to things like summer jobs, those are traditionally the people who are filling them. There may have been some discomfort there around uh, health and safety, or there may have been some uh, discomfort coming from the businesses side on having people coming in who are unvaccinated. Um, I think it's it's different region by region, but I think there are a number of things that that are playing into the labor shortage, not strictly just on the wage side. Well, it, it, you know, three months in a row now, we, we've seen a drop of un, in, in unemployment. It's now at 7.1%. I, I'm kind of curious you know, I think that's getting pretty close to the pre-pandemic levels. Where, where are these people? Or are these people just opted out of the whole market in general? So I think in some cases, there's some some encouraging to get people back in. But I want to underscore that this isn't a pandemic problem. This was a massive problem before the pandemic started. We had labor shortage issues across all sectors, across all regions, across all provinces in this country. We were getting calls from uh, Orangeville, it's a town a little bit outside of Toronto, uh, $50,000 full benefit manufacturing job, could not find a warm body. Um, we are hearing now in the pandemic that business owners are having eight or nine interviews lined up in a day and every single person ghosts on them because they've found a job somewhere else. We've heard of uh, you know places like grocery stores offering signing bonuses. Nothing, you know, we're not talking about sports level monster signing bonuses, yeah. but you know, a few hundred bucks to sign on um, because it is that competitive right now. So I think there is certainly a, a job out there for people who want it, um, but it's it's been a challenge for a lot of business owners, particularly in urban centers, to get employees to to come in and to come back in full. Um, and it's an important thing and something we're looking at policy fixes for as governments put their uh, platforms out because it is something that if they cannot sort out relatively quickly, that will hamper recovery uh, on the small business side. Ian, the Bank of Canada left its uh, prime rate unchanged. Is, is that a reflection of wanting to not appear political or because it wasn't required? Um, very interesting question. Um, and I don't, uh, I have, I've met the governor of the Bank of Canada in the past in downtown Ottawa. As you know, downtown Ottawa is a pretty small community. Um, I've met him through the Ottawa Economics Association. I don't pretend to be, uh, you know, a close friend or uh, at all. But um, I, I do think that in the last several years, under both administrations, both liberal and conservative, that the central bank has become more political. And I do not mean partisan. I do not mean that at all. I'm not saying that you know they're having but going to fundraising campaigns. Political in the sense that uh, successive federal governments have felt that they have a more a greater interest in what the interest rate environment is. And they realize it has consequences for voters and you know, mortgage rates going up or mortgage rates going down. And so uh, they've been more willing to uh, put subtle tacit pressure on, on the central, central bank. I mean, uh, if you compare, and I've done so just for fun, uh, idle curiosity research, if you compare uh, speeches by the central bank governor of let's say 20 years ago, 
uh, to a, to today or the last two or three years. I'm not picking on the current governor. And they're talking about things that once upon a time, central bankers just didn't talk about. I mean, they didn't talk about equity. They didn't talk about um, uh, inequality. I mean, that was just absolutely, that was fiscal policy. That wasn't, you know, hardcore monetary policy. And so there's a blurring, you know, where the, the monetary policy is becoming more and more concerned with fiscal policy and, you know, environmental, global warming and so forth. So to your question, I, I think it's because there is an election and they would have been attacked if rates had gone up. Uh, I think that they were very cautious of that. Uh, and uh, that was part of it. And then the other is this debate that the other motivator, the other contributor is there is a debate over whether or not we're, you know, the, the pandemic has run its course. I'm talking in terms of the economy. I'm one of those people who think that we've mostly recovered. And I also believe that the large majority of us were never affected in the sense that we professors weren't laid off, public mm -hmm. servants weren't laid off, bus drivers weren't laid off. It fell overwhelmingly, disproportionately on the private sector and more precisely on small and medium sized businesses. And so, you know, there's that debate should we even be pumping more stimulus in when? The unemployment rate is almost back to pre-pandemic levels. I think it's within 250,000 people. So I mean, so that was probably uh, a second reason is that they don't want to bring that debate up in the middle of the election and being accused of intervening or interfering in the election. Okay, Carl, okay, okay go to, ahead, jump in. Yeah, I just want to jump into two things that Ian raised. Uh, first, that the uh, when you when you say that the economic uh, impact of the pandemic fell on small and medium-sized business. Another way of putting that is, is that it fell on less well-paid workers in terms of the workers who were affected, mm -hmm. less, mm -hmm. less secure, less yeah. well-paid, less likely to be unionized yes. workers, and many more women workers, more part-time workers, uh, and, and again, less stable and secure workers. And that goes back to the question of to me, uh, a, a public policy, a perhaps counterintuitive public policy uh, solution to labor shortage can partly be to make that kind of work uh, more attractive. Obviously, I mean, you know, Jagmeet Singh on one side of the political spectrum will say when people complain about the Serb or the successor to the Serb being a dissuasive factor, and I was glad to hear Ryan say it isn't really a dissuasive factor because mm. it's too little money it is to dissuade somebody from working. but. The, the, a dissuasive factor for certain kind of jobs is the nature of the work, which is lacking security, lacking benefits, lacking pension, lacking access to unemployment insurance. And if there are ways working together with industry to make this work more attractive, more stable, uh, not just better rewarded in terms of the hourly rate, but better rewarded in terms of the benefits and in terms of uh, access to uh, uh, something resembling a pension and something resembling employment insurance. I mean, one thing the pandemic showed as an aside mm -hmm. is that our employment insurance system was kind of weak and flawed because we couldn't just use that during the pandemic. We had to create the CERB to fill that gap. So I think that would actually make it easier to hire because the jobs would be more attractive uh, to many people. But I want to make just one small comment, only as a humorous aside. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian Lee was talking about monetary policy. You were talking about the bank. I find it amusing that the Conservative Party is running ads mocking the pro current uh, the Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party, Justin Trudeau. At one point, he was asked about um, bank policy, monetary policy, and he said, I don't concern myself with monetary policy because that's the business of the Bank of Canada. I'm not going to meddle mm -hmm. in monetary policy. So they took that little clip out and then they juxtaposed that clip to um, uh, to the, the conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, talking about fiscal policy. That is measures such as government spending and taxation and regulation saying Trudeau, they confuse, they know that you could walk up and down the streets of a major Canadian city for months and not find a person who could tell you the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. I know many journalists who don't know the difference. So they just creating this confusion. Trudeau says, I'm not concerned about monetary policy. They think the voters will think he's saying, I'm not concerned about economic policy, whereas we're concerned about economic policy. The word fiscal policy is a technical word, and I'm sure we could stump 
Mm. Most people, even most of the members of the press gallery, if you ask them for a definition of it, and similarly monetary policy. And I know that the Conservative Party realizes they're not, so they're really selectively quoting uh, Trudeau here and tr trying to make it seem like he's against, mm. against economic policy, but he was actually making a legitimate point saying, well, it's not my business as the Prime Minister to meddle in monetary policy. Uh, Ryan, uh, you know, we, we talked about small business and obviously it, it's tired of the lockdowns and we can see why, but you know, we have this Delta variant. There's another one uh, as well that has seemed to rise and, and we have a possible fourth wave or depending on who you talk to, we're in that fourth wave. Uh, how How is it that these small businesses can can have any form of of positive feeling about the future when it just looks like the same same thing over and over for the last well it'd be a year and a half but probably two years by the time this is done. Well, I mean it's it's tough, and I think you know a small business owner tends to be optimistic by nature, right? You don't really jump into putting your your life savings or your family's house or whatever it may be into something if you don't really believe that it's going to work. Uh, that being said, there is a ton of pessimism out there, in particular over the short term. We'll say our year over year number, I think th people think a year from now things will be looking up. But if you're looking at like the next three months, there's not a lot of confidence that things are going to get a whole lot better. And I mean, it's it's tough for small business owners when you hear politicians talk about, you know, well, the word game changer, I think is something that needs to be retired after this. Um, but, you know, vaccines are a game changer this time around. Well, Every other time that we've been through this, every other time the numbers have crept up like this, we've been shut down. And I'm thinking here in Ontario specifically, but we haven't just been shut down. We've been shut down for a month that turned into two, that turned into three, for some businesses a little bit longer than that, depending on where they are. And it's really hard to shake the notion that that's just going to happen again this time around. I mean, three lockdowns were bad enough. It was incredibly difficult. And thank goodness the support programs that were there were there. I think a lot of businesses would have gone under in full if they weren't. Um, but a fourth shutdown would be catastrophic. And as it stands right now, the federal programs turn into a pumpkin in October. Most of the provincial support programs across the country are already gone. Businesses are... are you know, without the the safety wings on on right now, and and with this not necessarily being over, it's it's tough and something that governments are really going to have to look at. I, I get the desire to look past this. I think we're all tired of being stuck in our homes. I think we're all tired of looking at the the same four walls. I mean, I love my wife, but I'd love to see another human being uh, in person. But at the same time, this is still here. This is something that we still need to have rules around and restrictions around to protect public health and safety. And as long as we're doing that, I think it's important that the government is also there to help protect the businesses to ensure that they're able to uh, survive through as they do what they need to do to protect public health and safety. Ian, the Liberals are betting and having on their national child care plan. Had, it, it, some form is a, a job creation plan as well. Conservatives, they want to cancel those deals with the provinces and offer tax credits. Could it be financially beneficial to cancel the plan and go with the tax credits? Um, this is a very controversial uh, subject, as you can imagine. Um, it's not as universal an appeal as many uh, believe, uh, because uh, I looked up the numbers uh, on this. Um, there's 1.5 million children between the ages of one and five, according to Stats Canada. And it's unlike other areas, you know, unemployment, there's lots of people and potentially all of us lose our job at some point, I suppose, in our career. But with children, it's a, it's a very defined program for a very defined number of people. The number of people, well, the parents of the people between one and five, and guess what? They don't stay between one and five. Mm -hmm. They graduate year by year out. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that, well, I understand, I do understand the argument uh, that has been made. Um, all of us, I'm sure, in this program have had children. I have children, I have grandchildren who have just graduated from daycare into, into grade one. And um, I'm not sure it has the appeal that many people think it does. Uh, it's massively expensive. Um, and uh, that's the first point. That's just the sheer cost of it. And then of course, there's the counter argument, well, it's a barrier for women to enter the labor force. But then the second point is, is, the, is the accessibility. And the liberal plan is more, much more generous, but it only benefits a very small number of people. And the independent nonpartisan analysis has said that because there's first off, there's a shortage of subsidized daycare spaces. 
Whereas the conservative plan is much more geared, according to the analyses I've read of independent analysts that I respect, it's geared towards uh, lower income people because it is a tax credit and it is loaded towards lower end people. And more importantly, it can go to anybody. It can go to anybody with however they want to spend it. Uh, I just want to uh, ahead, leap, uh, leap in because this plays politically. If we're just talking about the politics of it very differently in different parts of the country. Uh, outside of Quebec, nobody else already has a child care program mm. that's more or less what the federal government is trying to get other provinces to implement. So that in Quebec, uh, cancelling this means uh, that the province of Quebec loses $6 billion a year that they're about to get from the federal government. And Quebecers generally like and appreciate their child care program, and even people who uh, Aaron O'Toole, who doesn't think it's an appropriate program for the rest of Canada, says, great for Quebec, good for them, I respect what they're doing. So, which begs the question, why is Quebec, why is what's good for Quebec not potentially good for other provinces? You know, in terms of childcare, some would wonder, is Quebec kind of uh, what Saskatchewan was for healthcare, for childcare for Canada? The, 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 you know, but it, it took longer between the time Saskatchewan got its health care uh, and the rest of us adopted a similar program uh, and Quebec's, ch Quebec's child care now has already been uh, around for a long, long time. Uh, a dear friend of mine in Montreal, long retired, uh, was a civil servant who got that implemented in Quebec and it was quite a while ago. But, but I think that outside of Quebec, um, since we're dealing with a hypothesis uh, that takes time to negotiate, the details of which are complicated, the politics are that maybe people... Um, are kind of on the fence, or are not sure what to think of what what to think about it. Uh, I've even met people who think that they have managed to pay the huge tariff you have to pay for childcare in Toronto, and they worry that a new system will mean inferior care, or not enough care, or or shortages, or other issues, and they worry about that. So, you know, I'm sure that there's many people among whom you know a group of people for whom it would be popular in principle, even if they don't have children of their own, and others who. Uh, have young children or are about to have young children who think this would be a great idea in the rest of Canada. But in Quebec, everybody thinks it's a great idea. Mm. You, I mean, you couldn't, if, if we still had telephone booths, you couldn't fill a telephone booth with opponents of the child care program in Quebec. There aren't any. There's nobody uh, is against it. So losing six billion is a political issue in Quebec. I don't dispute what you said about Quebec, but I think we're glossing over the huge, enormous fundamental difference. One is a top-down centralized plan saying you can only go through subsidized government daycare centers, and that's the liberal plan. The, 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 the appeal of the conservative plan, and I talk to people who do have young children, is there's lots of parents in this country who say, I don't want to send my kids to a government daycare center. I want my mother to raise my kids while I'm at work. And believe me, I know people like that. You're talking to one of them. I had that with my own children. I said, I don't, I had the ability to send them to extremely expensive daycare. I said, I don't want them to go there. I want them raised by my parents and my then wife's parents. And, and we split it up and organized it that way. And I am not the only person out of 38 million people that think like that. There are lots of people who say, I want my mother, my brother, my, my, my sister who's staying home with kids anyways. And so it's the element of lack of choice. It's not the generosity of the liberal plan or the Quebec plan. It's that you must and only must go through the government program. And there's lots of people who say, but wait a minute, I don't want them there. I want my a member of the family raising my kids for those four years between age one, when I go back from maternity leave or paternity leave, to the time they enter into the public school system. I want them raised by a member of the family. And the, the Quebec model, if we can call it that, does not give you that choice. And it is very popular. It may not be fashionable to say what I'm saying. And I know it would. Uh, all my colleagues and people who live in the Glebe with me would probably be tearing out their hair right now if they heard me, because this is not a position you argue in the beaches in Toronto or the town of Mount Royal in Montreal. But out in the burbs, what I'm saying, this resonates hugely. Ryan, does the National Child Care Program, whatever party, does that resonate with the members there with CFIB? We've asked a little bit about it on a sort of preliminary basis, and there's it's divided amongst business owners. I think it depends on whether or not it achieves its goals. And if it's if the goal is to get women back into work, because women are underrepresented in the workforce and this is a barrier, if this solves that and helps address the labor shortage through that, 
I think it's something that would be well received. The key is going to be, will it do that and at what cost? And will the benefit of getting those people back into the workforce outweigh the cost of the program? My one bit of hesitation here is that at this time, with the amount of spending that uh, continues to be done with the position that governments are in and businesses are in, it's a very expensive experiment to not be sure about. Uh, and I think that's where a business owner's hesitation would really come from is if this works the way it's promised to work, I think there would be, it would be it end up being positive. You'd have a bunch of people back in the workforce, help solve the labor shortage. Again, top issue amongst business owners. If it didn't do that, and, and I don't know if Quebec's numbers show better representation because of their program. I'm, I'm unaware of what they are. But if it didn't do that, I think you then get a lot of anger and frustration at a very expensive program with the what, what I think from a small business view with the fundamental goal of that program having failed uh, to, to put on the taxpayer. Ian, uh, the Conservatives are making a case for, well, I guess they're trying to paint the Liberals about a so-called home equity tax. Uh, of course, they're denying it. It's going back and forth. But hypothetically, if something like that came around, would that be an economic boom for the country or is that political suicide? Well, let me deal with the last one first. I think it would be political suicide. I have, uh, I'm quite a bit older than everybody here, except possibly Carl, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can remember, I've lived in Ottawa all my life, by the way, and my mm. partner lived in, worked in the public service 35 years. My father was in the public service for 42 years and all my friends are in the public service. Finance Canada, so this is not a partisan statement at all. Finance Canada bureaucrats, public servants, senior economists at finance have been talking, discussing about the idea of a tax, capital gains tax on principal residents, all the way back to the 1970s when John Crosby was the Minister of Finance and Joe Clark came in. So that's the first point. The second point I want to, uh, to bring it right up to date to answer your question, is this a, a, a real, what will impact will this have on the country? And the answer is very clearly that it's going to have a huge impact on all the millennials who think they're going to inherit the 1.5 trillion that the BMO pension fund has estimated that we boomers, my generation are holding and are going to pass on to them. So it could have huge impact once the millennials realize this is coming out of their pocket. I just, okay, I'm going to leap in again because, uh, sure. you know, when the point came up, when Aaron O'Toole raised the point, even CBC journalists or other journalists raised right away, the liberals are talking about a flipping tax. They're not talking about a home equity tax. They're mm -hmm. talking about people who briefly move into a home with the express purpose of flipping it and making a profit and goosing the market and causing house prices to increase. So it's a similar move to moves we hear to talk, talking about limiting and, and managing and regulating foreign ownership. Uh, I mean, that's quite different uh, than having me, who somebody like me who has lived in his house uh, since 1989 and then uh, wants to sell it, have to pay a tax on that. They're, they're not talking about that. They're not talking at all about a tax on a person selling their principal residence. They're talking about a narrow category of people who exploit this tax uh, loophole mm. or this tax measure uh, in order to run a kind of business. And I've met there were people on my block in the sort of Island Park area of uh, Ottawa who did that. I remember people exactly doing it and being honest about it, moving in, saying, well, I'm going to flip it. And they, they were there for a while. And there's people who, there are a couple of houses in our neighborhood where that happened. People move in, fix it up, goose it up, you know, uh, mm. spruce it up. The next thing you know, they've sold it and they've made a big uh, profit. Uh, how you... I mean, the problem is how you would then determine who is flipping and who moved, but then had was transferred to another job and had to move again might be a complicated thing. But the intent of what they want to do is to tamp down the increase in home prices. It's part of a policy, yeah. whether it will succeed or not, to prevent home prices from continuing to rise beyond the capacity of people to pay them. It's not at all a revenue grab. It's really a kind of regulatory policy. They're not, they don't think they're going to get a huge amount of revenue out of that. The idea is to dissuade people uh, from doing that sort of thing, which causes house prices to, uh, uh, to jump. 
Well, a great discussion, uh, folks. Uh, I want to thank our guest tonight, today on Unpublished TV, Ian Lee with the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. Carl Narenberg is the political reporter at Rabble, and Ryan Mal is the Senior Director of Provincial Affairs for Ontario at the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. Coming up on the next Unpublished TV, we'll look back on the debates and the campaign leading up to election night. Thanks for watching Unpublished TV. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.